Hey, Stacy. Happy Tuesday morning. Hey, Kelly. Praise God. We're going to start. I'm going to try not to waste time this morning. Um, as y'all saw, hey, Lisa. Hey, Vaughn. As y'all saw, um, Irma has finally cleared our area. And I'm so thankful. Prayers were answered. Somebody said, well, they just overestimated it. No, they didn't. God just took care of it. But there's a lot of suffering going on, and we have to remember to be praying for those people because, wow, just tremendous suffering. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get into it. Um, the topic of the Bible study today is looking in the mirror. And... Um, I've just been overwhelmed with what God has shown me today. I did a I did a little happy dance a little while ago and Sarah said, What? What is it? What is it? I said, I just saw something new. And I love it when God does that when we're studying the Bible. And um He does it a lot. If you let him. So we're gonna start looking in the mirror. Now our first Bible study we did was on worship because it all begins with worship. And then we've got sanctification. Uh, then we did the will of God, and then we took two weeks to do that one. And last week we did inventory. Did y'all notice that after I posted the Bible study, it stopped at 12 minutes with the audio? I mean, the video was great, but the audio stopped. And I, I'm telling you, the devil absolutely hated that Bible study, which means I'm probably going to have to do it again. I don't, you know, I don't have a verbatim thing that I do. I have my notes, but, um, you know, what I say is, as I'm going through it, it, it just hopefully comes straight from the Lord. So I don't know exactly what I said. So we'll have to do it again and see what God says the next time. But, um, Evidently, the devil did not want that Bible study to go out. But in the process of all of that and um, um, just praying for the Lord to confirm to me things in my life, because I, I was just terribly attacked last week with my health. And y'all know I lost my little Maggie. She got hit by a car. And... Um, and then, you know, the storms were coming, and it was just it was just a week of serious prayer time. Not fear, because we don't walk in fear as Christians, um, but prayer. We needed to be on our knees in prayer, and, and boy, were we. But this week, we're going to talk about looking in the mirror. And you might automatically think, oh, this is going to be about, you know, your appearance and all that stuff. No. We're going to talk about looking in the spiritual mirror. Now, if you get something on appearance, that's between you and God. But that's not what I'm going to cover. So just hang with me and let's see where this goes. Um, the mirror that I'm referring to in this Bible study is the Word of God. That is our mirror. And... Um, I was thinking this morning, ladies, it's just us, so I can talk real, right? Like this morning when I got up and I go in there and brush my teeth and take whatever medicine I got to take, and then, you know, you start looking at your face. And you start seeing stuff that maybe wasn't there the day before. And, you know, you're looking down here and things are growing. And, you know, you're just examining your face in the morning. Do y'all do that? Oh. Sometimes it's not a good thing, but I do that, and and that's the same sort of thing that I'm talking about spiritually with the Word of God. We need to be examining every day, morning, noon, and night through the Word of God to see what we need to see, right? Um and I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I have so many good notes that I have, I've found and written, and I just want to make sure I don't skip anything. 
But it is vital for you every morning, every afternoon, every evening to examine yourself in the mirror of the Word of God. If you're not using the Word every single day, you're going to get off track. That's a guarantee. Um, Y'all just send me a little note now and tell me if the broadcast is clear and if it's functioning properly because I have no way of knowing except y'all let me know, okay? We want, as children of the Most High God, I think I can speak for all of us, we want to walk in truth. We don't want to be getting off target and then the Lord having to pull us back in. Um, that it's, it's like watching children grow up and they don't ever seem to learn. And you're having to constantly snatch them back, snatch them back, snatch them back. That's, that's not the best, most productive way, thanks, Wendy, to, to progress as Christians. We need to learn the path, oh, praise God, and stay on it. Now, the key is how to figure out what the truth is. You know, philosophers, that, that's what they talk about all the time. Oh, this is the truth, and this is the truth. And they get all lofty, and they get all deep thinky, but they don't actually function in the real world. They don't actually have what we call common sense. They're too high up here trying to figure out the truth that they miss the truth altogether. Do you all know what I mean? So when we get into the Word of God and we begin to examine it to look at the mirror of what it is for us, there's a couple of things I want you to think about. Now, if you've been in the Word most of your life, you're a mature Christian, um, you have begun to develop a proper understanding of the word, all the ways the word can function in your life. Now, most of you probably know the two words, logos and rhema. Winston's back here shaking. Do y'all hear his collar? Logos is this. It's this book. It's the written word, the chapters, the verses, the sentences, the um, all of this, the actual construct of the written word. This is the logos. And then we have the rhema. Rhema is the spirit enlightened truth of what the word is telling us. Now, I will tell you this. You don't get the rhema unless you've got the logos. I think a lot of people nowadays pray for these big old revelations from God, but... You got to do you got to do the basic stuff first. God is not going to take someone who doesn't pray, doesn't read their Bible, doesn't minister to the body of Christ, doesn't help their fellow man. A person that's not walking in any of the aspects of a child of God, God isn't going to like pour all the secrets of the universe into that person. It just doesn't work that way. You have to do the work of being a Christian. Now, don't think I'm talking about works. That's a whole nother subject. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you cannot have the beautiful, revelatory work of the Holy Spirit in your life if you have no clue whatsoever what the Word of God says. How do you fix that? Get in your Bible. Get in your Bible. Remember what I always tell you. Stop reading those footnotes. Please, please stop reading those footnotes. Read the Bible first. Read the actual Word of God first. When you've, when you've gotten that, you've gone through it, you've prayed for revelation from the Holy Spirit, you've asked the Lord to quicken your spirit to receive what He's telling you in the word, then later on, read a footnote, read a commentary, but don't do that first. That's like reading the book after you've watched the movie. 
read the book first. Because if you read the book first, you, you allow that to work inside of you, to create inside of you, and then you watch the movie later. I, I, I just about guarantee you that most of the time the movie is not going to be nearly as good as the book was. And you see my point. You need to study the word and know what it's telling you for real, not what somebody else is pre-digested and giving you. Okay. Um, we're going to start our first verse. And remember, we're talking about looking in the mirror. Our first verse is Ch John chapter 8, verse 32. John chapter 8, 32. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We're talking about looking in the mirror of the word and seeing what is truth in that mirror. When I look in the mirror in the morning, this is the truth. My imagination may tell me something totally different, but that mirror is telling me the truth, good or bad. Some mornings I get up and I see something that was not there the day before. Some mornings I get up and I think, not too bad today. Nothing to cry over today. You know what I'm saying? But when you get in the Word, sometimes you're reading and everything's like making sense and you're okay, you're at peace. Then the next day you might get up and you flip there and there's something God is really wanting you to deal with in your life. And, yeah, you may cry a little bit. I cry a lot when I read the Bible because it's it's correcting me. It's through that it's through that correction that we grow, right? Okay, for, Proverbs 12:22. Lying lips are abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are his delight. I was thinking about lipstick Amen. I was thinking about, you know, when I used to wear makeup, I'd do my whole scenario, the whole regime, and then I'd put on the lip liner, and then I'd put on my lipstick, and then I'd blot, and I might fix it and do it again. But it doesn't matter how much lipstick you put on somebody. If those lips are lying, it's an abomination. We can dress this whole thing up outwardly but what's going on the inside is going to show it's going to show john sixteen thirteen. how be it when he the spirit of truth is come he will guide you into all truth for he shall not speak of himself but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He's telling us the Lord is going to guide us. When we look in that mirror of the word of God, he is giving us the instructions that we need. Right? He's giving you the road map, the truth. And that's, you know, if I retitled this Bible study, it, it would be the truth because that's what we want. We don't need any more lies in our life. I don't know about y'all, but I've been lied to long enough. I want the truth. Just the facts, ma'am. Okay, John four twenty four. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. In order to understand the path that God has for our lives, we must understand the God that created us. Now, let's back up a little bit. His ways are above our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. So how do you understand somebody that's the creator of the universe? Anybody want to give me a guess? B-I-B-L-E, that's the book for me. I stand up alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. The Word of God. That's how we understand Him. I was about to get off on a rabbit trail. So, we have this mirror 
that is the reflection of who we are and who we should be. But I have y'all ever like walked down a sidewalk in town or maybe in a mall or somewhere store where there's a big plate glass window at a certain point walking past that window it can either be a mirror a reflection of you or it can be transparent to look into the other side right I mean, do y'all have y'all ever done that before and realized you you actually can see yourself in the in the window? I have thought about that so much. You'd be surprised. Does God want me to be a mirror reflection, or does He want me to be transparent, to be looked through? I'm pondering that. That is my question of the moment. Does he want me to reflect him or does he want me to be transparent so that people look through me and see him? Y'all ponder that for a minute. I don't have the answer, but I think it is a good question. Okay. Sometimes... When we don't like what we see, when we're looking, taking a good hard look at our lives and we don't like what we're seeing, we put on a mask. And I thought about that the other night when I was studying. I thought, Father, why, why do we persist in putting on a mask? The mask is never as attractive as what is real and and the truth is pretty much every time you wear a mask everybody that looks at you knows it's a mask we think we're hiding something with that mask but the facts are people around us know we're wearing one they can see it so I, I was pondering that the mask um, and I think really the truth is we put a mask on for several, one of several reasons, maybe multiple, because we're ashamed of ourselves and we don't want people to see what's behind that mask uh, and embarrassed. We're embarrassed by what we are or what we think we are. Um, we're afraid because we feel like if people see who we really are, they're going to hurt us. Um, and we do it for protection. Same same vein as for being afraid. That's right. Um, so, so I began to ponder those things about these masks that we wear. And, you know, some people wear different masks for different occasions, right? They, they show this view to this person, but then they go over here and they show this view to another person. And then there may be three or four more people or situations where we want to put on this false face because of one one or the other of these reasons. Um, so I began to study the word about that, about being false. And uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 12 through 13. For now we see through a glass darkly but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I am also known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. And I was looking at that, and you know the context of it, but the point being that at some point of your life, you're going to be looking through a dirty mirror. You're going to see um, a, a false reflection of who you really are. You're going to see that, and other people are going to see that. And it could be any number of reasons why this has occurred. But if you ever picked up a mirror, and, and you know, you're looking at it, and you think, what is that? Oh, oh, the mirror's dirty. So you start washing off the mirror. Well, our mirror of the Holy Spirit, the, the Word of God, 
is never is never contaminated it's never dirty it's never splotchy it's never dusty it's clean and clear if we look at the mirror of the word and we see something that doesn't quite fit where's the problem it's not it's not the word that's the problem it's us it's us that's the problem and we need to fix that i can tell you Truthfully, I lost count a long time ago of the people that would contact me or come into my life and say, Oh, God has told me this. This is what I need to be doing. I've read this word and God has told me this. And, and I'm committed and it's revelation and he's shown me. I can see it in the word. And, you know, somehow between point A and point B, suddenly they don't see it anymore. That revelation is now gone. The meaning of those scriptures has now changed. And and the funny thing is, not funny, ha-ha, funny, weird. The funny thing is, they never seem to rise higher in their spiritual walk. They always seem to slide back to the more carnal things. It's like, God has suddenly given them a revelation that they don't have to be a stronger Christian, but they have actually got more freedom now to do what their flesh wants to do. Have you ever noticed that? That That is a sad place to be. When you've had real truth in your life, undeniable truth, and then you get tired and then you get weary, and you slowly start creeping back, and then you begin to make excuses. Well, you know, I'm getting old, I got wrinkles, I'm growing a beard, you know, I'm just not looking as good as I used to. You know what I'm saying? That's a sad place to be. But if you can be at peace and do the will of God for your life and look in this mirror of the Word and say, Lord, I see ugliness in me based on your word. I see things about me that are, are unpleasant. But, Father, your word is true. So I'm going to work on this. And, Lord, you help me, please, to work on these areas of my life. And you get started working on them. Don't slide back because it's unpleasant to your flesh to do what that mirror is telling you to do. Oh. Is heartbreaking. I mean, it really is because when you do that, you have to you have to come back over that mountain again. You have to go through that valley again. You have to make all those struggles all over again. And it's it's just like when the the Hebrew children were brought out of Egypt and he brought them out into the desert and they moaned and they whined and they griped. Take us back to Egypt. At least we had some food there. Yeah, we got beat twice a day. Yeah, we had to work like dogs. And yeah, our children were murdered in front of us. But at least we had some grits. You know, really? Really? Is that what we're after? To feed our bellies and to feed our flesh? That's more important than eternity? Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Okay. Luke six twenty six. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. You know, if you're putting on a false face and you're acting a part like, is, like you were in a uh, movie, you can make people really like you. You can, you can, you know... People at the church will like you. People down at the football game will like you. People at the bar will like you. Everybody will like you. Oh, she's just so sweet. I just love her. She's so friendly, and she's always a barrel of laughs. You know, we have a great time. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. 
I'm not saying you shouldn't be friendly and kind and loving and giving and caring. That is absolutely what you should be. But if you are holding no standard and everybody, everybody just thinks you're the bee's knees, I'm, I'm serious about that. You really, really do need to start examining. Look in that mirror. Read the word and see. It's not that you want to antagonize everybody in your life, but mm, mm, something to think about. Matthew seven sixteen through 17. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. But the corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. That, to me, that is about as blunt as you can get. If you're not, if you're not living out the life of Christ daily in your life, well, this is a Bible study, y'all. So I'm sharing with you the scriptures. You've got to examine yourselves. To see where that fits in your life. Okay, James chapter 1, verses 23 and 24. Don't y'all just love the book of James? I'm telling you, the book of James is like every phrase is meat. It's a roast beef dinner. And if you ever want to know where to start studying, whoo, study the book of James. It'll take care of a whole lot of stuff. Okay, James 1, 23 through 24. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he is. As women... We don't often forget what we look like, do we? Now, I will grant you, there have been times I got up in the morning, got dressed, put on my head covering, you know, my face is clean, my teeth are brushed, drink me a cup of coffee, and head out to the barn. Maybe it's barn cleaning day. I tell you what, when I come back in the house around lunchtime, Go back to the bathroom and clean. start cleaning myself up to make lunch. What is looking in that mirror at me was not what left that morning going out to the barn. Oh, it is tragic. I mean, you know, stuff gets everywhere when you're scrubbing, does it not? But that's okay. Women don't really forget what they look like. But if you are using the Word of God... And, and let's say you've got a need in your life. Let's say you've got a, a problem, a relationship maybe, and, and you know, you're really starting to feel bad. And, and oh, I better get in the Bible and see what the Bible says. You know, it says there's, there's nowhere in the Bible that says you may slap them. Wouldn't it be nice if there was a scripture that said that? But there's not. I've looked. I've actually topic studied it. There's not one spot that says that. But I want to slap myself sometimes because I think, okay, Father, you revealed this weakness in me, this ugly thing that you wanted me to deal with. And I went on and I dealt with it one time. And later on, I came back and I looked in that mirror again, and lo and behold, that ugly, nasty thing is still there. We can't forget. We, we can't forget because it's, it's one step forward and two steps back. If you're still making the same foolish, sinful errors that you made when you first came to the Lord, something ain't right. I have... An apple tree that I planted 10 years ago. There has not been one apple produced on that tree. It is a gorgeous tree. 
very healthy, right up there amongst a bunch of other fruit trees. But that apple tree, I mean, I think maybe five blooms, but never an apple. Never an apple. And it's right there by the beehive, so I know it's getting pollinated. Something is not right. Am I hilarious, Haley? I hope it's a good hilarious and not a ha-ha, you're nuts hilarious. Anyway, when the Lord reveals something to you, don't walk away and just forget it the next time crisis happens. Hold on to that truth and keep that truth alive in you. And then you start progressing. Then you become a vessel that the Lord can really use. That's right. It's, it's failure to thrive. Isn't that what it's called when a baby does not do well and does not grow? It's called failure to thrive. And failure to thrive in the word of God becomes very evident to the people around us. I found this when I was going through this study. And I was looking at this one about beholding the natural face in a glass. And y'all remember what I said. Don't read the footnotes and commentaries first. Read the Bible first. And then you can read the commentaries. And that's what I did. I studied this, but then I came up to Matthew Henry. Y'all know I love Matthew Henry. The Word of God is a glass in which we may see our own faces. And with it, we must compare our own hearts and lives that finding out our blemishes, we may wash with particular sorrow and application of the blood of Christ to our souls. Usually, the more particular we are in the confession of sin, the more comfort we have in the sense of the pardon. Wow, I just, boy, that just, it just gripped me. Because when I am real, with God, he gets real with me. When I take off that false face, that pretense, when I quit the acting, have y'all ever acted a part to God? Like, you go to pray and you just like, you just like, oh, Holy Father, we call those King James prayers. Oh, Holy God in heaven, Thank you, Lord, for your immense blessings. And you go on and on and on and on and on. God knows how we talk. He knows how we talk. He hears us talking to everybody around us every day. And he knows everything within us. Get real with God. Be real with him. And he will be real with you. And he will help you heal. He'll help you grow. He'll help you strengthen where you're weak. I'm looking at the time, y'all. I'm going to try really hard not to go over this week. Okay, another reason to wear a mask. Shame. That who we are is not and will not ever be what we want to be. We wear these masks to to cover our shame many times. Have you ever been ashamed? You know, when you grow up a poor person in a poor home, poverty stricken, you feel a lot of shame. Um, sometimes people hurt physically hurt you and instead of feeling sad we feel shame there's lots of reasons that the devil put shame on us but we don't have to feel shame before God He knows it all anyway. You know, when, when God walked in the cool of the evening with Adam and Eve, they were naked before him, completely naked before him. It, it, it wasn't even anything. It was nothing. It was just life. It was the way they were. 
They didn't feel any shame. But then the devil came in. And then they hid themselves. And we hide ourselves. We we think if we just if we just keep this part covered, maybe God and maybe other people won't see it. But it's still there. And y'all know, mamas especially know, when kids get splinters, you get something out of place. You can't hide it. It won't be hidden. It's going to have to be dealt with. And shame is a horrible thing. It's a horrible thing. And we don't have to be ashamed before God. God is... He already knows. He already knows. And he's not going to expose you to the world. If there's something in your life that you are really grieving over, something that you are ashamed of, whether valid or not, and I say that because if you've done something shameful of your own will, that's a different kind of shame. But both kinds can be and need to be dealt with. The shame that others have put on you and the shame that perhaps you have done. You need to deal with that once and for all. Now, I'm, I'm going to give you a little, a little hint here. The devil's going to bring it up again. And every time he brings it up, you will have to deal with it again through the mirror of the Word of God, the truth, Remember, you got to get in there to figure out the truth. It's not, it's not a mind game. We're not dealing with psychology. We're talking about the spirit of a holy God. His system is not psychology, like visualization and, and um, humming to yourself and chanting mantras. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. That's not, that's not how it works. It's not how it works. By prayer, supplication, praise, worship, study. Sometimes you need to go to another person. You need to confess things. Things that you've done, things that have been done to you. You need to find someone that, that can be within your Holy of Holies, a place of most honor and respect and and a minister and it may not be a preacher it may not be uh, an ordained deacon it may be that little old lady who lives two houses down from you and you know that she spends her time in prayer maybe you need to go talk to her ladies Maybe you need to talk to your husband. I can't say who that person is in your life. If you get down on your knees and you spend time on your knees and you're in worship and prayer and study and the Lord says, I want you to go talk to this person. He's not going to humiliate you in some public forum. He's not going to do that. You're his child. He loves you. He loves you. Deal with whatever that is and move on past it. Let that be history in your life. And let me tell you, I know what I'm talking about here. I know what it's like to have shame put on me and my own self having made bad choices but I'm free from the pain of those now the memory's still there but the pain is gone because it's been dealt with I encourage you and I didn't mean to get stopped on this but I'm just doing what the Lord's telling me get rid of that move forward move forward Shelly we're still on live I hope you can I hope you can participate um, Second Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved of God 
a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Pretty clear. 1 Timothy 2, 8 through 10. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but that which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Now, I wanted to add that in there. Because of shamefacedness, and I want to, I want to clarify what that means. It means a sense of of shame or honor that's the one we're going for that's why it was put in there a sense of honor modesty bashfulness reverence regard for others respect shamefacedness is that humble spirit you know when I was growing up I was taught to look people in the eye. And if they challenge you, you look them in the eye. Don't you downcast your eyes. You look them in the eye. You challenge them. You know what? That is just, that is not equal to what the Word of God is telling us. And I don't mean you don't look somebody in the eye when you need to. Because that is truth. But have you noticed now that people who are lying through their teeth will look you in the eye doing it? That has become such a phenomenon to me. Used to be they will look you in the eye to convey there was nothing to be ashamed of. They were telling you the truth. But now they look you in the eye lying through their teeth. It's not a good thing happening in our society anymore. But shamefacedness in this verse means modestly. Not challenging. Not daring somebody to make a mistake or say the wrong word. But not, not placing yourself above and over somebody. Now... There's a whole study on modesty that I need to do. We need to do. We all need to do. But I want you to imagine a woman of Jesus' time. Let's say um, the woman at the well. Do you think for one minute that that woman walked up to him and stared him down through that eyebrow thing? How do you do that? I don't think so. Now, she had reason to be ashamed, but I still believe that she had a sense of modesty about her, a sense of respect for the Lord. So that's the target. I think that's the target. Do y'all think that's the target? Okay, putting on that mask because we're embarrassed. We, we hide our face from people because... Because we become embarrassed. Hang on just a minute. Um, that others will recognize our failure to watch who they think we are. Um, Proverbs 14.5 A faithful witness will not lie. But a false witness will utter lies. I got to studying the word witness. You know, false witness is all through the word. People talk about being a false witness. Have you ever thought about the word witness? I'm not going to get off on that because it's, it's a side trail. But the more I thought about it in relation to these verses, it really brought out a whole new aspect of being a witness, a false witness or a true witness of the Lord. Going back to that mask that we, we uh, wear at times, that's a false witness. 
It is presenting something that is not accurate to the truth. Proverbs 12, 22. Lying lips are abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are his delight. Remember that lipstick I was talking about earlier? Lying lips. Ooh! Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. You can slap a ton of lipstick on those lips, but if they're lying, they're nasty. Nasty. Psalms 119-104. Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. Do you hate false ways? Do you hate lying? Or do you tell them every now and then? We convince ourselves that evil is good sometimes. Exodus 38, 8. And he may, okay, stay with me on this verse because it was really amazing. Exodus 38, 8. And he made the laver of brass and the foot of it of brass, of the looking glasses of the women assembling, which assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Okay, I had to do a little study on that one. That's the only time that that particular Hebrew word, I looked in the Strong's Concordance, that is the only time that that Hebrew word, which I cannot pronounce, was translated as looking glass. It was translated for things like the presence of God, which, oh, boy, that, that just gives me goosebumps when I think about it. But they're creating the temple, and they're making all of the tools and all of the things that go in the temple. And the laver was brass, and he's describing it, but the women had given their mirrors for the use of creating the labor. And the labor, let me verify this before I get myself messed up. I'm looking it up. Hang on. I'm pretty sure was the sink, the wash pan, the wash pot. The laver was what they washed the things in for the use of the temple. So that these women had brought, and usually it was polished bronze was the mirror, the looking glass of the time. It was polished. And, and you know, you've seen metal that was so shiny and bright that you it was a mirror. It reflected. And uh, so they had given these looking glasses to be melted down to create this laver where they would wash, wash the blood away. Anyway, I got to thinking about it. I don't think there's ever been a woman in the history of the world that didn't want to at some point look at her reflection and see how she looked. Right? So, but these women made a decision to take their looking glass and to offer it for the Lord's work. They took what showed their reflection to offer it for the Lord. Does that not strike y'all as really amazing? I mean, I just... Wow. I just... I wish y'all would ponder that for a while. The very thing that they could see who they were became useless to them. So they handed it over to the hand of God to be used by God in this temple, in this beautiful temple. They didn't need their looking glass anymore. Does that make sense? They didn't need it anymore. 
because they were fully giving themselves over to God. Now maybe I'm oversimplifying the situation or maybe I'm making it more deeper than it really was. But I don't think so. I don't think so. I think there's meat in that verse. Exodus 38, 8. They gave their looking glasses over to the work of the Lord. The last one I'm going to cover, fear. We put on a mask sometimes because of fear. That we in some way are going to be harmed if people see the real us. But remember, you cannot... You can't hide anything from God. Even your deepest thoughts. He is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. The devil isn't. But God is. God knows your thoughts. He knows the motives of everything you say and do. So, please, ladies, don't try to mask yourself from God it's not possible anyway and what a waste of effort and energy be real with God and he will be real with you okay Psalms 145 18 the Lord is nigh unto them all them that call upon him to all that call upon him in truth Proverbs twelve seventeen. he that speaketh truth showeth forth righteousness, but a false witness deceit. Remember what I said about witness. And then Isaiah. Actually, I don't think I'm going to use that verse in this section. So, the last thing that I want to talk about is protection. This false face, looking in the mirror, guarding yourselves from harm that you think others might do you. Mm-hmm. Genesis thirty eight fifteen. Here's the thing. Even people who say they don't know what they're supposed to do, they don't know what's supposed to happen next in their life, they don't know. The truth of it is, except and I'll say except on rare occasions. But the truth of it is, for almost everybody, we already have it planned out. We already have some idea of what we think is supposed to happen next in our life, in a relationship, in a situation, um, whatever. We already have some kind of inkling of where we want the situation to go, right? We have a plan. Now... If you're functioning out of your flesh, the plan is probably not going to follow the plan of God. When we put these masks on, we design the mask we want people to see. Um, you know, kids, like I said before, I hope and pray y'all don't do Halloween, but we're just going to look at Halloween masks. A kid gets an idea of what they want to dress up like. You go to Walmart, you see all these masks. Well, you know, Susie wants to be a princess or Wonder Woman, and Billy wants to be a Superman or a pirate. They already have an idea of what they want to be. We already have an idea of what we want to present to this world, and in our own silliness of what we want to present to God. So we fashion the mask the way we want it to look and like I said at the beginning we put masks on for different people we we have a mask for the world we've got a mask for the church we have a mask for God we got a mask for our family how confusing I mean really isn't it confusing but Genesis 38 15 this is the story of of Tamar and her husband died or was killed I can't remember and in that culture if there was a son an unmarried son he was to be given to that woman to bear children with and um, the father-in-law did not give her the son when he grew up to 
bear children with, even though he promised her he would. So, she dressed up like a harlot. She dressed up like a prostitute, found a place to wait, mm. and when he came along, she, um, she vamped him. When Judah saw her, he thought her to be a harlot because she had covered her face. She had a plan. She had a motive. And she had an end result in mind. And she dressed the part. Now, if you are dressing the part, if you are dressing the part of multiple people, you know that's called schizophrenia in psychology. Aren't you glad we're not doing psychology? It's not going to work. At some point, it's all going to collapse. And the Bible, being our mirror, tells us clearly the one that he wants us to have. Not the one that your flesh is happy with. Not the one that maybe even your church is promoting. I don't know what kind of church you go to, so I can't say it's right or wrong. But if your church is not lining up to what the Word of God is saying, I'll just let you and God talk about that. But, ladies, we've got to get this squared away. Because, you know... Things are happening in the world. People have no respect for the church anymore because it's dysfunctional. Why should they bother with the Lord when his own children don't bother with him? Let's look in the mirror. Let's get this right. And the final script, oh, I have, I have several things, but when we started, I shared with y'all a question that hit me when I began my study about um, mirrors and glass. And I read in Revelation, there's four places in Revelation that I found the words glass. There may be more, but Revelation 4, 6. And before the throne, there was a sea like unto glass, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four bees full of eyes and before and behind. There's a sea of glass. Revelation 15, 2. And I saw it as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire. Them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having harps. of God. Revelation 21, 18. And the building of the wall of it was as, as of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. Revelation 21, 21. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was one of pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. And I'm going back to my question. And I'm going to finish with this question. The topic of the Bible study was looking into the mirror. And I explained to you to begin with. The mirror that we are to look into is the word of God. Anything flesh is useless for a Christian. The things that boil up within your flesh. Deal with them. Get rid of them. Because the goal is what's happening with that mirror. That's the goal. And the question is, are you to be a reflection of Christ? And you say, well, yeah, I'm supposed to reflect Christ. Or... Are we supposed to be transparent glass where someone looks at it and completely through it to what's on the other side? 
and I looked it up. Reflection. The act of reflecting as in casting back a light or heat, mirroring or giving back or showing an image, the state of being reflected. In physics, this process of is reflecting light, sound, or image. So here's an image, and I'm going to reflect it back. Or, are we supposed to be transparent? Allowing light to pass through so that objects behind can be distinctly seen. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. I think... I don't have this concrete answer because I've got to study my Bible some more. But I think just based on what I've read so far, and that's a lot, and by what I feel the Holy Spirit prompting me when I'm on my knees, being real with God, I think he wants me to be glass. I think it starts with reflection. It starts with learning who he is and trying to be that in this world. But ultimately, I think he wants me to disappear and him to be clear. Yes. Yes. I hope you ladies are reading the comments that are coming through because, boy, are they good. Now, I'm going to close with that. And I want to thank you. I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for the prayers. I have felt them. My blood sugar is really good. Y'all know my, my little puppy died. And before I started, I checked my Franklin to make sure he was okay. Whatever the devil does in attack, God takes care of. We may hurt a little while, but that only strengthens us when we do it right. But ladies, think about reflecting and transparency. Think about getting real with God and taking that mask off and using this word as your mirror. Okay? Please don't just listen to somebody's Bible study on Facebook or some preaching on Sunday morning on YouTube, please get in the word for yourself. And I love you guys, and I will see you next Tuesday, Lord willing. And y'all know we're coming down to the end of, of Haley's um, pregnancy, so Levi may be here in the next couple of weeks. Actually, it's less than two weeks now till her due date. So y'all be praying for her, that God will strengthen her for that delivery. And I love you all, and I'm praying for you all. And I thank you for joining me.